Section One of the P. D. Goth Collection. The Wood of the Dead by Algernon Blackwood. One summer, in my wanderings with a knapsack, I was at luncheon in the room of a wayside inn in the western country, when the door opened and there entered an old rustic, who crossed close to my end of the table and sat himself down very quietly in the seat by the bow window. We exchanged glances, or properly speaking, nods, for at the moment I did not actually raise my eyes to his face, so concerned was I with the important business of satisfying an appetite gained by tramping twelve miles over a difficult country. The fine warm rain of seven o'clock, which had since risen in a kind of luminous mist about the treetops, now floated far overhead in a deep blue sky, and the day was settling down into a blaze of golden light. It was one of those days peculiar to Somerset in North Devon, when the orchards shine and the meadows seem to add a radiance of their own, so brilliantly soft are the colorings of grass and foliage. The innkeeper's daughter, a little maiden with a simple country loveliness, presently entered with a foaming pewter mug, inquired after my welfare, and went out again. Apparently she had not noticed the old man sitting in the settle by the bow window, nor had he, for his part, so much as once turned his head in our direction. Under ordinary circumstances, I should probably have given no thought to this other occupant of the room, but the fact that it was supposed to be reserved for my private use, and the singular thing, that he sat looking aimlessly out of the window, with no attempt to engage me in conversation, drew my eyes more than once somewhat curiously upon him, and I soon caught myself wondering why he sat there so silently, and always with averted head. He was, I saw, a rather bent old man in rustic dress, and the skin of his face was wrinkled, like that of an apple. Corduroy trousers were caught up with a string below the knee, and he wore a sort of brown, fustian jacket that was very much faded. His thin hand rested upon a stoutish stick. He wore no hat and carried none, and I noticed that his head, covered with silvery hair, was finely shaped and gave the impression of something noble. Though rather piqued by his studied disregard of my presence, I came to the conclusion that he probably had something to do with little hostel and had a perfect right to use this room with freedom, and I finished my luncheon without breaking the silence, and then took the settle opposite to smoke a pipe before going on my way. Through the open window came the scents of the blossoming fruit trees. The orchard was drenched in sunshine, and the branches danced lazily in the breeze. The grass below fairly shone with white and yellow daisies, and the red roses climbing in profusion over the casement mingled their perfume with the sweetly penetrating odor of the sea. It was a place to dawdle in, to lie and dream away a whole afternoon, watching the sleepy butterflies and listening to the chorus of birds which seemed to fill every corner of the sky. Indeed, I was already debating in my mind whether to linger and enjoy it all instead of taking the strenuous pathway over the hills, when the old rustic in the settle opposite suddenly turned his face towards me for the first time and began to speak. His voice had a quiet dreamy note in it that was quite in harmony with the day and the scene, but it sounded far away, I thought, almost as though it came to me from outside, where the shadows were weaving their eternal tissues of dreams upon the garden floor. Moreover, there was no trace in it of the rough quality one might naturally have expected, and now that I saw the full face of the speaker for the first time, I noted with something like a start that the deep, gentle eyes seemed far more in keeping with the timbre of the voice than with the rough and very countrified appearance of the clothes and manner. His voice set pleasant waves of sound in motion towards me, and the actual words, if I remember rightly, were, "'You are a stranger in these parts?' or, "'Is not this part of the country strange to you?' There was no sir, nor any outward, invisible sign of the deference usually paid by real country folk to the town-bred visitor." but in its place a gentleness, almost a sweetness, of polite sympathy, that was far more of a compliment than either. I answered that I was wandering on foot through a part of the country that was wholly new to me, and that I was surprised not to find a place of such idyllic loveliness marked upon my map. "'I have lived here all my life,' he said with a sigh, "'and am never tired of coming back to it again. "'Then you no longer live in the immediate neighborhood. "'I have moved,' he answered briefly adding after a pause, in which his eyes seemed to wander wistfully to the wealth of blossoms beyond the window. But I am almost sorry, for nowhere else have I found the sunshine lie so warmly. 
the flowers smell so sweetly, or the winds and streams make such tender music. His voice died away into a thin stream of sound that lost itself in the rustle of the rose leaves climbing in at the window, for he turned his head away from me as he spoke and looked out into the garden. But it was impossible to conceal my surprise, and I raised my eyes in frank astonishment on hearing so poetic an utterance from such a figure of a man, though at the same time realizing that it was not in the least inappropriate, and that, in fact, no other sort of expression could have properly been expected from him. "'I am sure you are right,' I answered at length, when it was clear he had ceased speaking. "'Oh, there is something of enchantment here, of real fairy-like enchantment, that makes me think of the visions of childhood days, before one knew anything of... of... I had been oddly drawn into his vein of speech, some inner force compelling me. But here the spell passed, and I could not catch the thoughts that had a moment before opened a long vista before my inner vision. "'To tell you the truth,' I concluded lamely, "'the place fascinates me, and I am in two minds about going further.' Even at this stage I remember thinking it odd that I should be talking like this with a stranger whom I met in a country inn, for it has always been one of my failings that to strangers my manner is brief to surliness. It was as though we were figures meeting in a dream, speaking without sound, obeying laws not operative in the everyday working world, and about to play with a new scale of space and time, perhaps. But my astonishment passed quickly into an entirely different feeling, when I became aware that the old man opposite had turned his head from the window again, and was regarding me with eyes so bright they seemed almost to shine with an inner flame. His gaze was fixed upon my face with an intense ardor, and his whole manner had suddenly become alert and concentrated. There was something about him, I now felt for the first time, that made little thrills of excitement run up and down my back. I met his look squarely, but with an inward tremor. "'Stay then a little while longer,' he said in a much lower and deeper voice than before. "'Stay, and I will teach you something of the purpose of my coming.' He stopped abruptly. I was conscious of a decided shiver. "'You have a special purpose, then, in coming back?' I asked, hardly knowing what I was saying. "'To call away someone,' he went on in the same thrilling voice, "'someone who is not quite ready to come, but who is needed elsewhere for a worthier purpose.' There was a sadness in his manner that mystified me more than ever. "'You mean?' I began with an unaccountable access of trembling. "'I have come for someone who must soon move.' even as I have moved. He looked me through and through with a dreadful, piercing gaze, but I met his eyes with a full, straight stare, trembling though I was, and I was aware that something stirred within me that had never stirred before, though for the life of me I could not have put a name to it, or have analyzed its nature. Something lifted and rolled away. For one single second I understood clearly that the past and the future exist actually side by side in one immense present, that it was I who moved to and fro, among shifting, protean appearances. The old man dropped his eyes from my face, and the momentary glimpse of a mightier universe passed utterly away. Reason regained its sway over a dull, limited kingdom. "'Come to-night,' I heard the old man say. "'Come to me to-night, into the wood of the dead. Come at midnight.' Involuntarily I clutched the arm of the settle for support for I then felt that I was speaking with someone who knew more of the real things that are and will be than I could ever know while in the body, working through the ordinary channels of sense, and this curious half-promise of a partial lifting of the veil had its undeniable effect upon me. The breeze from the sea had died away outside, and the blossoms were still. A yellow butterfly floated lazily past the window. The song of the birds hushed. I smelt the sea. I smelt the perfume of heated summer air rising from the fields and flowers the ineffable sense of June and of the long days of the year, and with it, from countless green meadows beyond, came the hum of myriad summer life, children's voices, sweet pipings, and the sound of water falling. I knew myself to be on the threshold of a new order of experience, of an ecstasy. Something drew me forth with a sense of inexpressible yearning towards the being of this strange old man in the window seat, and for a moment I knew what it was to taste a mighty and wonderful sensation and to touch the highest pinnacle of joy I have ever known. It lasted for less than a second and was gone, but in that brief instant of time the same terrible lucidity came to me that had already shown me how the past and future exist in the present, and I realized and understood that pleasure and pain are one and the same force, 
for the joy I had just experienced included all the pain I ever had felt, or ever could feel. The sunshine grew to dazzling radiance, faded, passed away. The shadows paused in their dance upon the grass, deepened a moment, and then melted into air. The flowers of the fruit trees laughed with their little silvery laughter, as the wind sighed over their radiant eyes the old, old tale of its personal love. Once or twice a voice called my name. A wonderful sensation of lightness and power began to steal over me. Suddenly the door opened and the innkeeper's daughter came in. By all ordinary standards, hers was a charming country loveliness, born of the stars and wildflowers, of moonlight shining through autumn mists upon the river and the fields. Yet by contrast with the higher order of beauty I had just momentarily been in touch with, she seemed almost ugly. How dull her eyes, how thin her voice, how vapid her smile, and insipid her whole presentment. For a moment she stood between me and the occupant of the window-seat, while I counted out the small change for my meal and for her services. But when an instant later she moved aside, I saw that the settle was empty, and that there was no longer anyone in the room but our two selves. This discovery was no shock to me. Indeed, I had almost expected it. And the man had gone just as a figure goes out of a dream, causing no surprise and leaving me as part and parcel of the same dream without breaking of continuity. But as soon as I had paid my bill and thus resumed, in very practical fashion, the thread of my normal consciousness, I turned to the girl and asked her if she knew the old man who had been sitting in the window seat, and what he had meant by the wood of the dead. The maiden started visibly, glancing quickly round the room, but answering simply that she had seen no one. I described him in great detail, and then as the description grew clearer, she turned a little pale under her pretty sunborn and said very gravely that it must have been the ghost. "'Ghost? What ghost?' "'Oh, the village ghost,' she said quietly, coming closer to my chair with a little nervous movement of genuine alarm, and adding in a lower voice, "'He comes before a death, they say.' It was not difficult to induce the girl to talk, and the story she told me, shorn of the superstition that had obviously gathered with the years round the memory of a strangely picturesque figure, was an interesting and peculiar one. The inn, she said, was originally a farmhouse, occupied by a yeoman farmer, evidently of a superior, if rather eccentric, character, who had been very poor until he reached old age, when a son died suddenly in the colonies and left him an unexpected amount of money, almost a fortune. The old man thereupon altered no whit his simple manner of living, but devoted his income entirely to the improvement of the village and to the assistance of its inhabitants. He did this quite regardless of his personal likes and dislikes, as if one and all were absolutely alike to him, objects of a genuine and impersonal benevolence. People had always been a little afraid of the man, not understanding his eccentricities, but the simple force of this love for humanity changed all that in a very short space of time, and before he died he came to be known as the father of the village, and was held in great love and veneration by all. After a short time before his end, however, he began to act queerly. He spent his money just as usefully and wisely, but the shock of sudden wealth after a life of poverty, people said, had unsettled his mind. He claimed to see things that others did not see, to hear voices, and to have visions. Evidently he was not of the harmless, foolish, visionary order, but a man of character and of great personal force, for the people became divided in their opinions, and the vicar, good man, regarded and treated him as a special case. For many his name and atmosphere became charged almost with a spiritual influence that was not of the best. People quoted texts about him, kept when possible out of his way, and avoided his house after dark. None understood him, but though the majority loved him, an element of dread and mystery became associated with his name, chiefly owing to the ignorant gossip of the few. A grove of pine trees behind the farm, the girl pointed them out to me on the slope of the hill, he said was the wood of the dead, because just before anyone died in the village he saw them walk into that wood, singing. No one who went in ever came out again. He often mentioned the names to his wife, who usually published them to all the inhabitants within an hour of her husband's confidence, and it was found that the people he had seen enter the wood died. On warm summer nights he would sometimes take an old stick and wander out, hatless, under the pines, for he loved this wood, and used to say he met all his old friends there, and would one day walk in there never to return. His wife tried to break him gently of this habit, but he always had his own way, 
and once, when she followed and found him standing under a great pine in the thickest portion of the grove, talking earnestly to someone she could not see, he turned and rebuked her very gently, but in such a way that she never repeated the experiment, saying, "'You should never interrupt me, Mary, when I am talking with the others, for they teach me, remember, wonderful things, and I must learn all I can before I go to join them.' This story went like wildfire through the village, increasing with every repetition, until at length every one was able to give an accurate description of the great veiled figures the woman declared she had seen moving among the trees where her husband stood. The innocent pine grove now became positively haunted, and the title of Wood of the Dead clung naturally, as if it had been applied to it in the ordinary course of events by the compilers of the Ordnance Survey. On the evening of his ninetieth birthday, the old man went up to his wife and kissed her. His manner was loving and very gentle, and there was something about him besides, she declared afterwards, that made her slightly in awe of him and feel that he was almost more of a spirit than a man. He kissed her tenderly on both cheeks, but his eyes seemed to look right through her as he spoke. Dearest wife, he said, I am saying good-bye to you, for I am now going into the wood of the dead and I shall not return. Do not follow me or send to search, but be ready soon to come upon the same journey yourself. The good woman burst into tears and tried to hold him, but he easily slipped from her hands, and she was afraid to follow him. Slowly she saw him cross the field in the sunshine and then enter the cool shadows of the grove, where he disappeared from her sight. That same night, much later, she woke to find him lying peacefully by her side in bed, with one arm stretched out towards her, dead. Her story was half believed, half doubted at the time, but in a very few years afterwards it evidently came to be accepted by all the countryside. A funeral service was held to which the people flocked in great numbers, and every one approved of the sentiment, which led the widow to add the words, The Father of the Village, after the usual texts which appeared upon the stone over his grave. This, then, was the story I pieced together of the village ghost, as the little innkeeper's daughter told it to me that afternoon, in the parlour of the inn. But you're not the first to say you've seen him, the girl concluded, and your description is just what we've always heard. In that window, they say, was just where he used to sit and think and think, when he was alive, and sometimes, they say, to cry for hours together. And would you feel afraid if you had seen him? I asked, for the girl seemed strangely moved and interested in the whole story. I think so, she said timidly. Surely if he spoke to me. He did speak to you, didn't he? She asked after a slight pause. He said he had come for someone. Come for someone, she repeated. Did he say? She went on falteringly. No, he did not say for whom, I said quickly, noticing the sudden shadow on her face and the tremulous voice. Are you really sure, sir? Oh, quite sure, I answered cheerfully. I did not even ask him. The girl looked at me steadily for nearly a whole minute, as though there were many things she wished to tell me or to ask. But she said nothing, and presently picked up her tray from the table and walked slowly out of the room. Instead of keeping to my original purpose and pushing on to the next village over the hills, I ordered a room to be prepared for me at the inn, and that afternoon I spent wandering about the fields and lying under the fruit trees, watching the white clouds sailing out over the sea. The wood of the dead I surveyed from a distance, but in the village I visited the stone erected to the memory of the father of the village, who was thus evidently no mythical personage, and saw also the monuments of his fine unselfish spirit, the schoolhouse he had built, the library, the home for the aged poor, and the tiny hospital. That night, as the clock in the church tower was striking half-past eleven, I stealthily left the inn and crept through the dark orchard and over the hayfield in the direction of the hill whose southern slope was clothed with the wood of the dead. A genuine interest impelled me to the adventure, but I also was obliged to confess of a certain sinking in my heart as I stumbled along over the field in the darkness, for I was approaching what might prove to be the birthplace of a real country myth in a spot already lifted by the imaginative thoughts of a considerable number of people into the region of the haunted and ill-omened. The inn lay below me, and all around it in the village clustered in a soft black shadow, unrelieved by a single light. The night was moonless, yet distinctly luminous, for the stars crowded the sky. The silence of deep slumber was everywhere, so still indeed that every time my foot kicked against a stone, I thought the sound must be heard below in the village and waken the sleepers. 
I climbed the hill slowly, thinking chiefly of the strange story of the noble old man who had seized the opportunity to do good to his fellows the moment it came his way, and wondering why the causes that operate ceaselessly behind human life did not always select such admirable instruments. Once or twice a night-bird circled slowly over my head, but the bats had long since gone to rest, and there was no other sign of life stirring. Then suddenly, with a singular thrill of emotion, I saw the first trees of the Wood of the Dead rise in front of me in a high black wall. Their crests stood up like giant spears against the starry sky, and though there was no perceptible movement of the air on my cheek, I heard a faint rushing sound among their branches as the night breeze passed to and fro over their countless little needles. A remote hushed murmur rose overhead and died away again almost immediately, for in these trees the wind seemed to be never absolutely at rest, and on the calmest day there was always a sort of whispering music among their branches. For a moment I hesitated on the edge of this dark wood, and listened intently. Delicate perfumes of earth and bark stole out to meet me. Impenetrable darkness faced me. Only the consciousness that I was obeying an order strangely given, and including a mighty privilege, enabled me to find the courage to go forward and step in boldly under the trees. Instantly the shadows closed in upon me, and something came forward to meet me from the center of the darkness. It would be easy enough to meet my imagination halfway with fact, and say that a cold hand grasped my own and led me, by invisible paths, into the unknown depths of the grove. But at any rate, without stumbling, and always with the positive knowledge that I was going straight towards the desired object, I pressed on confidently and securely into the wood. So dark was it that at first not a single star-beam pierced the roof of branches overhead, and as we moved forward side by side, the tree shifted silently past us in long lines, row upon row, squadron upon squadron, like the units of a vast soundless army. And at length we came to a comparatively open space where the trees halted upon us for a while, and looking up, I saw the white river of the sky, beginning to yield to the influence of a new light that now seemed spreading swiftly across the heavens. "'It is the dawn coming,' said the voice at my side that I certainly recognized, but which seemed almost like a whispering from the trees. "'And we are now in the heart of the wood of the dead. We seated ourselves on a moss-covered boulder and waited the coming of the sun. With marvellous swiftness, it seemed to me, the light in the east passed into the radiance of early morning, and when the wind awoke and began to whisper in the treetops, the first rays of the risen sun fell between the trunks and rested in a circle of gold at our feet. "'Now come with me,' whispered my companion in the same deep voice, "'for time has no existence here, and that which I would show you is already there.' We trotted gently and silently over the soft pine needles. Already the sun was high over our heads, and the shadows of the trees coiled closely about their feet. The wood became denser again, but occasionally we passed through little open bits where we could smell the hot sunshine and the dry baked pine needles. Then presently we came to the edge of the grove, and I saw a hayfield lying in the blaze of day, and two horses basking lazily with switching tails in the shafts of a laden hay wagon. So complete and vivid was the sense of reality that I remember the grateful realization of the cool shade where we sat and looked upon the hot world beyond. The last pitchfork had tossed up its fragrant burden, and the great horses were already straining in the shafts after the driver as he walked slowly in front with one hand upon their bridles. He was a stalwart fellow, with sunburned neck and hands. Then for the first time I noticed, perched aloft upon the trembling throne of the hay, the figure of a slim young girl. I could not see her face, but her brown hair escaped in disorder from a white sunbonnet, and her still browner hands held a well-worn hayrake. She was laughing and talking with the driver, and he from time to time cast up at her ardent glances of admiration, glances that won instant smiles and soft blushes in response. The cart presently turned into the roadway that skirted the edge of the wood where we were sitting. I watched the scene with intense interest and became so much absorbed in it that I quite forgot the manifold strange steps by which I was permitted to become a spectator. "'Come down and walk with me,' cried the young fellow, stopping a moment in front of the horses and opening wide his arms. "'Jump, and I'll catch you.' "'Oh, oh!' she laughed, and her voice sounded to me as the happiest, merriest laughter I had ever heard from a girl's throat. "'Oh, oh, that's all very well, but remember, I'm queen of the hay, and I must ride.' "'Then I must come and ride beside you,' 
he cried, and began at once to climb up by the way of the driver's seat. But with a peal of silvery laughter, she slipped down easily over the back of the hay to escape him, and ran a little way along the road. I could see her quite clearly, and noticed the charming natural grace of her movements, and the loving expression in her eyes as she looked over her shoulder to make sure he was following. Evidently she did not wish to escape for long, certainly not forever. In two strides the big brown swain was after her, leaving the horses to do as they pleased. Another second in his arms would have caught the slender waist and pressed the little body to his heart, but just at that instant the old man beside me uttered a peculiar cry. It was low and thrilling, and it went through me like a sharp sword. He had called her by her own name, and she had heard. For a second she halted, glancing back with frightened eyes. Then with a brief cry of despair, the girl swerved aside and dived in swiftly among the shadows of the trees. But the young man saw the sudden movement and cried out to her passionately, "'Not that way, my love, not that way, it's the wood of the dead!' She threw a laughing glance over her shoulder at him, and the wind caught her hair and drew it out in a brown cloud under the sun. But the next minute she was close beside me, lying on the breast of my companion, and I was certain I heard the words repeatedly uttered with many sighs, "'Father, you called and I have come, and I come willingly, for I am very, very tired.' At any rate, so the words sounded to me, and mingled with them I seemed to catch the answer in that deep, thrilling whisper I already knew. And you shall sleep, my child, sleep for a long, long time, until it is time for you to begin the journey again. In that brief second of time I had recognized the face and voice of the innkeeper's daughter. But the next minute a dreadful wail broke from the lips of the young man, and the sky grew suddenly as dark as night. The wind rose and began to toss the branches about us, and the whole scene was swallowed up in a wave of utter blackness. Again the chill fingers seemed to seize my hand, and I was guided by the way I had come to the edge of the wood and crossing the hayfield, still slumbering in the starlight, I crept back to the inn and went to bed. A year later I happened to be in the same part of the country, and the memory of the strange summer vision returned to me with the added softness of distance. I went to the old village, and had tea under the same orchard trees at the same inn. But the little maid of the inn did not show her face, and I took occasion to inquire of her father as to her welfare and her whereabouts. Married, no doubt, I laughed, but with a strange feeling that clutched at my heart. "'No, sir,' replied the innkeeper sadly. "'Not married, though she was just going to be, but dead. She got a sunstroke in the hayfields just a few days after you were here, if I remember rightly. And she was gone from us in less than a week.'" End of The Wood of the Dead by Algernon Blackwood Section 2 of the P.D. Goth Collection the Night Doings at Deadman's A Story That Is Untrue by Ambrose Bierce It was a singularly sharp night, and clear as the heart of a diamond. Clear nights have a trick of being keen. In darkness you may be cold and not know it. When you see, you suffer. The night was bright enough to bite like a serpent. The moon was moving mysteriously along behind the giant pines crowning the south mountain striking a cold sparkle from the crusted snow, and bringing out against the black west the ghostly outlines of the coast range, beyond which lay the invisible Pacific. The snow had piled itself in the open spaces along the bottom of the gulch, into long ridges that seemed to heave, and into hills that appeared to toss and scatter spray. The spray was sunlight, twice reflected, dashed once from the moon, once from the snow. In this snow, many of the shanties of the abandoned mining camp were obliterated. A sailor might have said they had gone down, and at irregular intervals it had overtopped the tall trestles which had once supported a river called a flume. For, of course, flume is flumen. Among the advantages of which the mountains cannot deprive the gold hunter is the privilege of speaking Latin. He says of his dead neighbour, he has gone up the flume. This is not a bad way to say, his life has returned to the fountain of life. While putting on its armour against the assaults of the wind, this snow had neglected no coin of vantage. Snow pursued by the wind is not wholly unlike a retreating army. In the open field it ranges itself into ranks and battalions. Where it can get a foothold it makes a stand. Where it can take cover it does so. 
you may see whole platoons of snow cowering behind a bit of broken wall. The devious old road, hewn out of the mountainside, was full of it. Squadron upon squadron had struggled to escape by this line, when suddenly pursuit had ceased. A more desolate and dreary spot than Deadman's Gulch in a winter midnight it is impossible to imagine. Yet Mr. Hiram Beeson elected to live there, the sole inhabitant. Away up the side of the North Mountain, his little pine log shanty projected from its single pane of glass a long thin beam of light, and looked not altogether unlike a black beetle fastened to the hillside with a bright new pin. Within it sat Mr. Beeson himself before a roaring fire, staring into its hot heart as if he had never before seen such a thing in all his life. He was not a comely man. He was grey. He was ragged and slovenly in his attire. His face was wan and haggard. His eyes were too bright. As to his age, if one had attempted to guess it, one might have said forty-seven, then corrected himself and said seventy-four. He was really twenty-eight. Emaciated he was, as much, perhaps, as he dared be, with a needy undertaker at Bentley's flat, and a new and enterprising coroner at Sonora. Poverty and zeal are an upper and a nether millstone. It is dangerous to make a third in that kind of sandwich. As Mr. Beeson sat there, with his ragged elbows on his ragged knees, his lean jaws buried in his lean hands, and with no apparent intention of going to bed, he looked as if the slightest movement would tumble him to pieces. Yet during the last hour he had winked no fewer than three times. There was a sharp rapping at the door. A rap at that time of night, and in that weather, might have surprised an ordinary mortal who had dwelt two years in the gulch without seeing a human face, and could not fail to know that the country was impassable. But Mr. Beeson did not so much as pull his eyes out of the coals. And even when the door was pushed open, he only shrugged a little more closely into himself, as one does who is expecting something that he would rather not see. You may observe this movement in women when, in a mortuary chapel, the coffin is borne up the aisle behind them. But when a long old man in a blanket overcoat, his head tied up in a handkerchief, and nearly his entire face in a muffler, wearing green goggles, and with a complexion of glittering whiteness where it could be seen, strode silently into the room, laying a hard gloved hand on Mr. Beeson's shoulder, the latter so far forgot himself as to look up with an appearance of no small astonishment. Whomever he may have been expecting, he had evidently not counted on meeting anyone like this. Nevertheless, the sight of this unexpected guest produced in Mr. Beeson the following sequence, a feeling of astonishment, a sense of gratification, a sentiment of profound good will. Rising from his seat, he took the knotty hand from his shoulder and shook it up and down with a fervour quite unaccountable for in the old man's aspect was nothing to attract, much to repel. However, attraction is too general a property for repulsion to be without it. The most attractive object in the world is the face we instinctively cover with a cloth. When it becomes still more attractive, fascinating, we put seven feet of earth above it. Sir, said Mr. Beeson, releasing the old man's hand, which fell passively against his thigh with a quiet clack. It is an extremely disagreeable night. Pray be seated. I am very glad to see you. Mr. Beeson spoke with an easy good breeding that one would hardly have expected, considering all things. Indeed, the contrast between his appearance and his manner was sufficiently surprising to be one of the commonest of the social phenomena in the mines. The old man advanced a step toward the fire, glowing cavernously in the green goggles. Mr. Beeson resumed. You bet your life I am. Mr. Beeson's elegance was not too refined. It had made reasonable concessions to local taste. He paused a moment, letting his eyes drop from the muffled head of his guest, down along the row of mouldy buttons confining the blanket overcoat, to the greenish cowhide boots powdered with snow, which had begun to melt and run along the floor in little rills. He took an inventory of his guest, and appeared satisfied. Who would not have been? Then he continued, The cheer I can offer you, unfortunately, is in keeping with my surroundings, but I shall esteem myself highly favoured if it is your pleasure to partake of it, 
rather than seek better at Bentley's flat. With a singular refinement of hospitable humility, Mr. Beeson spoke as if a sojourn in his warm cabin on such a night, as compared with walking fourteen miles up to the throat in snow with a cutting crust, would be an intolerable hardship. By way of reply, his guest unbuttoned the blanket overcoat. The host laid fresh fuel on the fire, swept the hearth with the tail of a wolf, and added, But, I think you better skedaddle. The old man took a seat by the fire, spreading his broad soles to the heat without removing his hat. In the mines the hat is seldom removed except when the boots are. Without further remark, Mr. Beeson also seated himself in a chair which had been a barrel, and which, retaining much of its original character, seemed to have been designed with a view to preserving his dust, if it should please him to crumble. For a moment there was a silence. Then, from somewhere among the pines, came the snarling yelp of a coyote, and simultaneously the door rattled in its frame. There was no other connection between the two incidents than that the coyote has an aversion to storms, and the wind was rising. Yet there seemed somehow a kind of supernatural conspiracy between the two, and Mr. Beeson shuddered with a vague sense of terror. He recovered himself in a moment, and again addressed his guest. There are strange doings here. I will tell you everything, and then, if you decide to go, I shall hope to accompany you over the worst of the way. As far as where Baldy Peterson shot Ben Hike, I dare say you know the place. The old man nodded emphatically, as intimating not merely that he did, but that he did indeed. Two years ago, began Mr. Beeson, I, with two companions, occupied this house. But when the rush to the flat occurred, we left, along with the rest. In ten hours, the gulch was deserted. That evening, however, I discovered I had left behind me a valuable pistol, that is it, and returned for it, passing the night here alone, as I have passed every night since. I must explain that a few days before we left, our Chinese domestic had the misfortune to die while the ground was frozen so hard that it was impossible to dig a grave in the usual way. So, on the day of our hasty departure, we cut through the floor there, and gave him such burial as we could. But before putting him down, I had the extremely bad taste to cut up his pigtail and spike it to that beam above his grave, where you may see it at this moment, or, preferably, when warmth has given you leisure for observation. I stated, did I not, that the Chinaman came to his death from natural causes? I had, of course, nothing to do with that, and returned through no irresistible retraction or morbid fascination, but only because I had forgotten a pistol. That is clear to you, is it not, sir? The visitor nodded gravely. He appeared to be a man of few words, if any. Mr. Beeson continued, According to the Chinese faith, a man is like a kite. He cannot go to heaven without a tail. Well, to shorten this tedious story, which, however, I thought it my duty to relate, on that night, while I was here alone and thinking of anything but him, that Chinaman came back for his pigtail. He did not get it. At this point, Mr. Beeson relapsed into blank silence. Perhaps he was fatigued by the unwonted exercise of speaking. Perhaps he had conjured up a memory that demanded his undivided attention. The wind was now fairly abroad, and the pines along the mountainside sang with singular distinctness. The narrator continued, You say you did not see much in that, and I must confess I do not myself. But he keeps coming. There was another long silence, during which both stared into the fire without the movement of a limb. Then Mr. Beeson broke out, almost fiercely fixing his eyes on what he could see of the impassive face of his auditor. "'Give it him. Sir, in this matter I have no intention of troubling anyone for advice. You will pardon me, I am sure.' Here he became singularly persuasive. "'But I have ventured to nail that pigtail fast and have assumed the somewhat onerous obligation of guarding it. So it isn't quite impossible to act on your considerate suggestion. Do you play me for a monarch? Nothing could exceed the sudden ferocity with which he thrust this indignant remonstrance into the ear of his guest. It was as if he had struck him on the side of the head with a steel gauntlet. It was a protest, but it was a challenge. To be mistaken for a coward, to be played for a modoc. These two expressions are one. Sometimes it is a Chinaman. 
Do you play me for a Chinaman is a question frequently addressed to the ear of the suddenly dead. Mr. Beeson's buffet produced no effect, and after a moment's pause, during which the wind thundered in the chimney, like the sound of clods upon a coffin, he resumed. But, as you say, it is wearing me out. I feel that the life of the last two years has been a mistake, a mistake that corrects itself. You see how. The grave. No, there is no one to dig it. The ground is frozen too. But you are very welcome. You may say at Bentley's. But that is not important. It was very tough to cut. They braid silk into their pigtails. Gwah! Mr. Beeson was speaking with his eyes shut, and he wandered. His last word was a snore. A moment later he drew a long breath, opened his eyes with an effort, made a single remark, and fell into a deep sleep. What he said was this, They are swiping my dust. Then the aged stranger, who had not uttered one word since his arrival, arose from his seat, and deliberately laid off his outer clothing, looking as angular in his flannels as the late Signorina Festorazzi, an Irish woman six feet in height and weighing fifty-six pounds, who used to exhibit herself in her chemise to the people of San Francisco. He then crept into one of the bunks, having first placed a revolver in easy reach, according to the custom of the country. This revolver he took from a shelf, and it was the one which Mr. Beeson had mentioned as that for which he had returned to the gulch two years before. In a few moments Mr. Beeson awoke, and seeing that his guest had retired, he did likewise. But before doing so he approached the long plaited wisp of pagan hair, and gave it a powerful tug, to assure himself that it was fast and firm. The two beds, mere shelves covered with blankets, not over clean, faced each other from opposite sides of the room, the square little trapdoor that had given access to the Chinaman's grave being midway between. This, by the way, was crossed by a double row of spike heads. In his resistance to the supernatural, Mr. Beeson had not disdained the use of material precautions. The fire was now low, the flames burning bluely and petulantly, with occasional flashes, projecting spectral shadows on the walls, shadows that moved mysteriously about, now dividing, now uniting. The shadow of the pendant queue, however, kept moodily apart, near the roof at the further end of the room, looking like a note of admiration. The song of the pines outside had now risen to the dignity of a triumphal hymn. In the pauses, the silence was dreadful. It was during one of these intervals that the trap in the floor began to lift. Slowly and steadily it rose, and slowly and steadily rose the swaddled head of the old man in the bunk to observe it. Then, with a clap that shook the house to its foundation, it was thrown clean back, where it lay with its unsightly spikes pointing threateningly upward. Mr. Beeson awoke, and without rising, pressed his fingers into his eyes. He shuddered, his teeth chattered. His guest was now reclining on one elbow, watching the proceedings with the goggles that glowed like lamps. Suddenly a howling gust of wind swooped down the chimney, scattering ashes and smoke in all directions, for a moment obscuring everything. When the firelight again illuminated the room, there was seen, sitting gingerly on the edge of a stool by the hearthside, a swarthy little man of prepossessing appearance, and dressed with faultless taste, nodding to the old man with a friendly and engaging smile. From San Francisco, evidently, thought Mr. Beeson, who, having somewhat recovered from his fright, was groping his way to a solution of the evening's events. But now another actor appeared upon the scene. Out of the square black hole in the middle of the floor protruded the head of the departed Chinaman, his glassy eyes turned upward in their angular slits, and fastened on the dangling queue above, with a look of yearning unspeakable. Mr. Beeson groaned, and again spread his hands upon his face. A mild odour of opium pervaded the place. The phantom, clad only in a short blue tunic quilted and silken, but covered with grave mould, rose slowly, as if pushed by a weak spiral spring. Its knees were at the level of the floor, when, with a quick upward impulse, like the silent leaping of a flame, it grasped the queue with both hands, drew up its body, and took the tip in its horrible yellow teeth. 
to this it clung in a seeming frenzy grimacing ghastly surging and plunging from side to side in its efforts to disengage its property from the beam but uttering no sound it was like a corpse artificially convulsed by means of a galvanic battery the contrast between its superhuman activity and its silence was no less than hideous mr beeson cowered in his bed the swarthy little gentleman uncrossed his legs beat an impatient tattoo with the toe of his boot and consulted a heavy gold watch the old man sat erect and quietly laid hold of the revolver bang like a body cut from the gallows the chinaman plumped into the black hole below carrying his tail in his teeth the trapdoor turned over shutting down with a snap the swarthy little gentleman from san francisco sprang nimbly from his perch caught something in the air with his hat as a boy catches a butterfly and vanished into the chimney as if drawn up by suction from away somewhere in the outer darkness floated in through the open door a faint far cry a long sobbing wail as of a child death strangled in the desert or a lost soul borne away by the adversary it may have been the coyote in the early days of the following spring a party of miners on their way to new diggings passed along the gulch and straying through the deserted shanties found in one of them the body of hiram beeson stretched upon a bunk with a bullet hole through the heart the ball had evidently been fired from the opposite side of the room for in one of the oaken beams overhead was a shallow blue dint where it had struck a knot and been deflected downward to the breast of its victim strongly attached to the same beam was what appeared to be the end of a rope of braided horsehair which had been cut by the bullet in its passage to the knot nothing else of interest was noted excepting a suit of mouldy and incongruous clothing several articles of which were afterward identified by respectable witnesses as those in which certain deceased citizens of deadman's had been buried years before but it is not easy to understand how that could be unless indeed the garments had been worn as a disguise by death himself which is hardly credible end of the night doings at deadman's by ambrose bierce chapter three shadow a parable by edgar allan poe yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow psalm of david ye who read are still among the living but i who write shall have long since gone my way into the region of shadows for indeed strange things shall happen and secret things be known and many centuries shall pass away ere these memorials be seen of men and when seen there will be some to disbelieve and some to doubt and yet a few who will find much to ponder upon in the characters here graven with a stylus of iron the year had been a year of terror and of feelings more intense than terror for which there is no name upon the earth for many prodigies and signs had taken place and far and wide over sea and land the black wings of the pestilence were spread abroad to those nevertheless cunning in the stars it was not unknown that the heavens wore an aspect of ill and to me the greek enos among others it was evident that now had arrived the alternation of that seven hundred and ninety-fourth year when at the entrance of aries the planet jupiter is conjoined with the red ring of the terrible saturnus the peculiar spirit of the skies if i mistake not greatly made itself manifest not only in the physical orb of the earth but in the souls imaginations and meditations of mankind over some flasks of the red chian wine within the walls of a noble hall in a dim city called ptolemasis we sat at night a company of seven and to our chamber there was no entrance save by a lofty door of brass and the door was fashioned by the artisan corinnos and being of rare workmanship was fastened from within black draperies likewise in the gloomy room shut out from our view the moon the lurid stars and the peopleless streets but the boding and the memory of evil they would not be so excluded there were things around us and about of which i can render no distinct account things material and spiritual heaviness in the atmosphere 
a sense of suffocation, anxiety, and above all that terrible state of existence which the nervous experience when the senses are keenly living and awake, and meanwhile the powers of thought lie dormant. A dead weight hung upon us. It hung upon our limbs, upon the household furniture, upon the goblets from which we drank, and all things were depressed and borne down thereby, all things save only the flames of the seven lamps which illumined our revel. Uprearing themselves in tall slender lines of light, they thus remained burning, all pallid and motionless. And in the mirror which their luster formed upon the round table of ebony at which we sat, each of us there assembled, beheld the pallor of his own countenance, and the unquiet glare in the downcast eyes of his companions. Yet we laughed, and were merry in our proper way, which was hysterical, and sang the songs of Anacreon, which are madness, and drank deeply, although the purple wine reminded us of blood. For there was yet another tenant to our chamber, in the person of young Zoilus. Dead, and at full length he lay, enshrouded, the genius and the demon of the scene, Alas, he bore no portion in our mirth, save that his countenance, distorted with the plague, and his eyes, in which death had but half extinguished the fire of the pestilence, seemed to take such interest in our merriment, as the dead may haply take in the merriment of those who are to die. But although I, Enos, felt that the eyes of the departed were upon me, still I forced myself not to perceive the bitterness of their expression, and gazing down steadily into the depths of the ebony mirror, sang with a loud and sonorous voice the songs of the son of Teos. But gradually my songs they ceased, and their echoes, rolling afar off among the sable draperies of the chamber, became weak and undistinguishable, and so faded away. And lo, from among those sable draperies where the sounds of the song departed, there came forth a dark and undefined shadow a shadow such as the moon when low in heaven might fashion from the figure of a man but it was the shadow neither of man nor of god nor of any familiar thing and quivering a while among the draperies of the room it at length rested in full view upon the surface of the door of brass but the shadow was vague and formless and indefinite and was the shadow neither of man nor of god neither god of greece nor god of chaldea nor any Egyptian god. And the shadow rested upon the brazen doorway, and under the arch of the entablature of the door, and moved not, nor spoke any word, but there became stationary, and remained. And the door whereupon the shadow rested was, if I remember aright, over against the feet of the young Zoilus enshrouded. But we, the seven there assembled, having seen the shadow as it came out from among the draperies, dared not steadily behold it, but cast down our eyes, and gazed continually into the depths of the mirror of ebony. And at length I, Enos, speaking some low words, demanded of the shadow its dwelling and its appellation. And the shadow answered, I am shadow, and my dwelling is near to the catacombs of Ptolemasus, and hard by those dim plains of refusion which border upon the foul Caronian canal. And then did we, the seven, start from our seats in horror, and stand trembling, and shuddering, and aghast, for the tones in the voice of the shadow were not the tones of any one being, but of a multitude of beings, and varying in their cadences from syllable to syllable, fell duskly upon our ears, in the well-remembered and familiar accents of many thousand departed friends. End of section 3 Chapter Four of P. D. Goth. Kierfol, by Edith Wharton. One. You ought to buy it," said my host. "It's just the place for a solitary-minded devil like you, and it would be rather worth while to own the most romantic house in Brittany. The present people are dead broke, and it's going for a song. You ought to buy it." It was not with the least idea of living up to the character my friend Longrevin ascribed to me. As a matter of fact, under my unsociable exterior, I have always had secret yearnings for domesticity. 
that I took his hint one autumn afternoon and went to Kerfol. My friend was motoring over to Compe on business. He dropped me on the way, at a crossroad on a heath, and said, First turn to the right and second to the left, then straight on till you see an avenue. If you meet any peasants, don't ask your way. They don't understand French, and they would pretend they did and mix you up. I'll be back for you here by sunset, and don't forget the tombs in the chapel. I followed Lanrevard's directions with the hesitation occasioned by the usual difficulty of remembering whether he had said the first turn to the right and second to the left, or the contrary. If I had met a peasant, I should certainly have asked, and probably been sent astray. But I had the desert landscape to myself, and so stumbled on the right turn, and walked on across the heath till I came to an avenue. It was so unlike any other avenue I have ever seen, that I instantly knew it must be THE avenue. The grey trunk trees sprang straight up to a great height, and then interwove their pale grey branches in a long tunnel through which the autumn light fell faintly. I know most trees by name, but I haven't to this day been able to decide what those trees were. They had the tall curve of elms, the tenuity of poplars, the ashen colour of olives under a rainy sky, and they stretched ahead of me for half a mile or so without a break in their arch. If ever I saw an avenue that unmistakably led to something, it was the avenue at Kerfol. My heart beat a little as I began to walk down it. Presently the trees ended, and I came to a fortified gate in a long wall. Between me and the wall was an open space of grass, with other grey avenues radiating from it. Behind the wall were tall slate roofs mossed with silver, a chapel belfry, the top of a keep. A moat filled with wild shrubs and brambles surrounded the place. The drawbridge had been replaced by a stone arch, and the portcullis by an iron gate. I stood for a long time, on the hither side of the moat, gazing about me, and letting the influence of the place sink in. I said to myself, If I wait long enough, the guardian will turn up and show me the tombs, and I rather hoped he wouldn't turn up too soon. I sat down on a stone and lit a cigarette. As soon as I had done it, it struck me as a puerile and portentous thing to do, with that great blind house looking down at me, and all the empty avenues converging on me. It may have been the depth of the silence that made me so conscious of my gesture. The squeak of my match sounded as loud as the scraping of a brake, and I almost fancied I heard it fall when I tossed it onto the grass. But there was more than that, a sense of irrelevance, of littleness, of childish bravado, in sitting there puffing my cigarette smoke into the face of such a past. I knew nothing of the history of Kerfol. I was new to Brittany, and Lanrevin had never mentioned the name to me till the day before. But one couldn't as much as glance at that pile without feeling in it a long accumulation of history. What kind of history I was not prepared to guess. Perhaps only the sheer weight of many associated lives and deaths, which gives a kind of majesty to all old houses but the aspect of Kerfol suggested something more, a perspective of stern and cruel memories stretching away, like its own grey avenues, into a blur of darkness. Certainly, no house had ever more completely and finally broken with the present. As it stood there, lifting its proud roofs and gables to the sky, it might have been its own funeral monument. Tombs in the chapel? The whole place is a tomb, I reflected. I hoped more and more that the guardian would not come. The details of the place, however striking, would seem trivial compared with its collective impressiveness, and I wanted only to sit there and be penetrated by the weight of its silence. "'It's the very place for you,' Lanrevin had said, and I was overcome by the almost blasphemous frivolity of suggesting to any living being that Kerfol was the place for him. "'Is it possible that anyone would not see?' I wondered. I did not finish the thought. What I meant was undefinable. I stood up and wandered toward the gate. I was beginning to want to know more, not to see more. I was by now so sure it was not a question of seeing, but to feel more, feel all the place had to communicate. But to get in, one would have to rout out the keeper, I thought reluctantly, and hesitated. Finally, I crossed the bridge and tried the iron gate. It yielded, and I walked down to the tunnel formed by the thickness of the Chemin de Ronde. At the farther end, a wooden barricade had been laid across the entrance, and beyond it I saw a court enclosed in noble architecture. 
The main building faced me, and now I discovered that one half of it was a mere ruined front, with gaping windows through which the wild growths of the moat and the trees of the park were visible. The rest of the house was still in its robust beauty. One end abutted on the round tower, the other on the small tracery chapel, and in an angle of the building stood a graceful well-head adorned with mossy urns. A few roses grew against the walls, and on an upper window-sill I remember noticing a pot of fuchsias. My sense of the pressure of the invisible began to yield to my architectural interest. The building was so fine that I felt a desire to explore it for its own sake. I looked about the court, wondering in which corner the guardian lodged. Then I pushed open the barrier and went in. As I did so, a little dog barred my way. He was such a remarkably beautiful little dog that for a moment he made me forget the splendid place he was defending. I was not sure of his breed at the time, but have since learnt that it was Chinese, and that he was of a rare variety called the Sleeve Dog. He was very small and golden brown, with large brown eyes and a ruffled throat. He looked rather like a large tawny chrysanthemum. I said to myself, These little beasts always snap and scream and somebody will be out in a minute. The little animal stood before me, forbidding, almost menacing. There was anger in his large brown eyes. But he made no sound. He came no nearer. Instead, as I advanced, he gradually fell back, and I noticed that another dog, a vague rough brindled thing, had limped up. There'll be a hubbub now, I thought, and at the same moment a third dog, a long-haired white mongrel, slipped out of a doorway and joined the others. All three stood looking at me with grave eyes, but not a sound came from them. As I advanced, they continued to fall back on muffled paws, still watching me. At a given point, they will all charge at my ankles. It's one of those dodges that dogs who live together put up on one, I thought. I was not much alarmed, for they were neither large nor formidable, but they let me wander through the courts as I pleased, following at a little distance, always the same distance and always keeping their eyes on me. Presently I looked across at the ruined façade, and saw that in one of its window frames another dog stood, a large white pointer with one brown ear. He was an old grave dog, much more experienced than the others, and he seemed to be observing me with a deeper intentness. I'll hear from him, I said to myself. But he stood in the empty window frame, against the trees of the park, and continued to watch me without moving. I looked back at him for a time, to see if the sense that he was being watched would not rouse him. Half the width of the court lay between us, and we stared at each other silently across it. But he did not stir, and at last I turned away. Behind me I found the rest of the pack, with a newcomer added, a small black greyhound with pale agate-coloured eyes. He was shivering a little, and his expression was more timid than that of the others. I noticed that he kept a little behind them, and still there was not a sound. I stood there for fully five minutes, the circle around me, waiting, as they seemed to be waiting. At last I went up to the little golden-brown dog and stooped to pat him. As I did so, I heard myself laugh. The little dog did not start or growl or take his eyes from me. He simply slipped back about a yard, and then paused and continued to look at me. "'Oh, hang it!' I exclaimed aloud, and walked across the court toward the well. As I advanced, the dogs separated and slid away into different corners of the court. I examined the urns on the well, tried a locked door or two, and up and down the dumb façade. Then I faced about toward the chapel. When I turned, I perceived that all the dogs had disappeared except the old pointer, who still watched me from the empty window frame. It was rather a relief to be rid of that cloud of witnesses, and I began to look about me for a way to the back of the house. Perhaps there'll be somebody in the garden, I thought. I found a way across the moat, scrambled over a wall smothered in brambles, and got into the garden. A few lean hydrangeas and geraniums pined in the flower beds, and the ancient house looked down on them indifferently. Its garden side was plainer and severer than the other. The long granite front, with its few windows and steep roof, looked like a fortress prison. I walked around the farther wing, went up some disjointed steps, and entered the deep twilight of a narrow and incredibly old box-walk. The walk was just wide enough for one person to slip through, and its branches met overhead. It was like the ghost of a box-walk. 
its lustrous green all turning to the shadowy greyness of the avenues. I walked on and on, the branches hitting me in the face and springing back with a dry rattle, and at length I came out on the grassy top of the Chemin de Ronde. I walked along it to the gate tower, looking down into the court, which was just below me. Not a human being was in sight, and neither were the dogs. I found a flight of steps in the thickness of the wall and went down them, and when I emerged again into the court, there stood the circle of dogs, the golden-brown one a little ahead of the others, the black greyhound shivering in the rear. "'Oh, hang it, you uncomfortable beast, you!' I exclaimed, my voice startling me with a sudden echo. The dogs stood motionless, watching me. I knew by this time that they would not try to prevent my approaching the house, and the knowledge left me free to examine them. I had a feeling that they must be horribly cowed to be so silent and inert. Yet they did not look hungry or ill-treated. Their coats were smooth, and they were not thin, except the shivering greyhound. It was more as if they had lived a long time with people who never spoke to them or looked at them, as though the silence of the place had gradually benumbed their busy, inquisitive natures. And this strange passivity, this almost human lassitude, seemed to me sadder than the misery of starved and beaten animals. I should have liked to rouse them for a minute, to coax them into a game or a scamper, but the longer I looked into their fixed and weary eyes, the more preposterous the idea became. With the windows of that house looking down on us, how could I have imagined such a thing? The dogs knew better. They knew what the house would tolerate, and what it would not. I even fancied that they knew what was passing through my mind, and pitied me for my frivolity, but even that feeling probably reached them through a thick fog of listlessness. I had an idea that their distance from me was as nothing to my remoteness from them. In the last analysis, the impression they produced was that of having in common one memory so deep and dark that nothing that had happened since was worth either a growl or a wag. I say! I broke out abruptly, addressing myself to the dumb circle. Do you know what you look like, the whole lot of you? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. That's how you look. I wonder if there is a ghost here, and nobody but you left for it to appear to. The dogs continued to gaze at me without moving. It was dark when I saw Lanrivain's motor lamps at the crossroads, and I wasn't exactly sorry to see them. I had the sense of having escaped from the loneliest place in the whole world, and of not liking loneliness, to that degree, as much as I had imagined I should. My friend had brought his solicitor back from Compé for the night, and, seated beside a fat and affable stranger, I felt no inclination to talk of Kerfol. But that evening, when Lanrivain and the solicitor were closeted in the study, Madame de Lanrivain began to question me in the drawing-room. "'Well, are you going to buy careful? she asked, tilting up her gay chin from her embroidery. "'I haven't decided yet. The fact is, I couldn't get into the house,' I said, as if I had simply postponed my decision, and meant to go back for another look. "'You could not get in? Why? What happened? The family are mad to sell the place, and the old guardian has orders.' "'Very likely.' but the old guardian wasn't there. What a pity! He must have gone to market. But his daughter! There was nobody about. At least I saw nobody. How extraordinary! Literally nobody! Nobody but a pack of dogs, a whole pack of them, who seemed to have the place to themselves. Madame de Lanrevin let the embroidery slip to her knee, and folded her hands on it. For several minutes she looked at me thoughtfully. A pack of dogs! You saw them? Saw them? I saw nothing else. How many? She dropped her voice a little. I've always wondered. I looked at her with surprise. I supposed the place to be familiar to her. Have you never been to Kerfol? I asked. Oh, yes, often, but never on that day. What day? I'd quite forgotten, and so had Herf, I'm sure. If we remembered, we never should have sent you today. But then, after all, one doesn't half believe that sort of thing, does one? What sort of thing? I asked, involuntarily sinking my voice to the level of hers. Inwardly, I was thinking, I knew there was something. Madame de Lanrivain cleared her throat and produced a reassuring smile. Didn't he have tell you the story of Careful? An ancestor of his was mixed up in it. You know, every Breton house has its ghost story, and some of them are rather unpleasant. "'Yes, but those dogs,' I insisted. 
Well, those dogs are the ghosts of Scaffold. At least, the peasants say there's one day in the year when a lot of dogs appear there, and that day the keeper and his daughter go off to Morlaix and get drunk. The women in Brittany drink dreadfully. She stooped to match a silk, and then she lifted her charming, inquisitive Parisian face. Did you really see a lot of dogs? There isn't one at Kefol, she said. 2. Lanri Vin, the next day, hunted out a shabby calf volume from the back of the upper shelf of his library. Yes, here it is. What does it call itself? A history of the assizes of the Duchy of Brittany, Compe, 1702. The book was written about a hundred years later than the Kerfol affair, but I believe the account is transcribed pretty literally from the judicial records. Anyhow, it's queer reading and there's a hair de l'enrivain mixed up in it. Not exactly my style, as you see, but then he's only a collateral. Here, take the book up to bed with you. I don't exactly remember the details, but after you've read it, I'll bet anything you'll leave your light burning all night. I left my light burning all night, as he had predicted, but it was chiefly because, till near dawn, I was absorbed in my reading. The account of the trial of Anne de Cournon, wife of the Lord of Kerfol, was long and closely printed. It was, as my friend had said, probably an almost literal transcription of what took place in the courtroom, and the trial lasted for nearly a month. Besides, the type of the book was detestable. At first, I thought of translating the old record literally but it is full of wearisome repetitions, and the main lines of the story are forever straying off into side issues. So I have tried to disentangle it, and give it here in a simpler form. At times, however, I have reverted to the text, because no other words could have conveyed so exactly the sense of what I felt at Kerfol, and nowhere else have I added anything of my own. 3. It was in the year 16 that Yves de Cournot, lord of the domain of Kerfol, went to the pardon of Longrenon to perform his religious duties. He was a rich and powerful noble, then in his sixty-second year, but hale and sturdy, a great horseman and hunter and a pious man, so all his neighbours attested. In appearance he seems to have been short and broad, with a swarthy face, legs slightly bowed from the saddle, a hanging nose, and broad hands with black hairs on them. He had married young, and lost his wife and son soon after, and since then had lived alone at Kelfol. Twice a year he went to Morlaix, where he had a handsome house by the river, and spent a week or ten days there, and occasionally rode to Rennes on business. Witnesses were found to declare that during these absences he led a life different from the one he was known to lead at Kerfol, where he busied himself with his estate, attended mass daily, and found his only amusement in hunting the wild boar and waterfowl. But these rumours are not particularly relevant, and it is certain that among people of his own class in the neighbourhood he passed for a stern and even austere man, observant of his religious obligations, and keeping strictly to himself. There was no talk of any familiarity with the women on his estate, though at that time the nobility were very free with their peasants. Some people said that he had never looked at a woman since his wife's death, but such things are hard to prove, and the evidence on this point was not worth much. Well, in his sixty-second year, Yves de Cournon went to the pardon at Longrenin, and saw there a young lady of Dornenay, who had ridden over a pillion behind her father to do her duty to the saint. Her name was Anne de Barrigan, and she came of good old Breton stock, but much less great and powerful than that of Yves de Cournot, and her father had squandered his fortune at cards, and lived almost like a peasant in his little granite manor on the moors. I have said I would add nothing of my own to this bold statement of a strange case, but I must interrupt myself here to describe the young lady who rode up to the leech-gate of Longrenin at the very moment when Baron de Cornet was also dismounting there. I take my description from a rather rare thing, a faded drawing in red crayon, sober and truthful enough to be by a late pupil of the Cloé, which hangs in Longrevin's study, and is said to be a portrait of Anne de Barrigan. 
It is unsigned and has no mark of identity but the initials A B and the date sixteen, the year after her marriage. It represents a young woman with a small oval face, almost pointed, yet wide enough for a full mouth with a tender depression at the corners. The nose is small, and the eyebrows are set rather high, far apart, and as lightly pencilled as the eyebrows in a Chinese painting. The forehead is high and serious, and the hair, which one feels to be fine and thick and fair, drawn off it and lying close like a cap. The eyes are neither large nor small, hazel probably, with a look once shy and steady. A pair of beautiful long hands are crossed below the lady's breast. The chaplain of Kerfol and other witnesses averred that when the baron came back from Longrenin, he jumped from his horse, ordered another to be instantly saddled, called to a young page come with him, and rode away that same evening to the south. His steward followed the next morning with coffers laden on a pair of pack mules. The following week, Yves de Cournot rode back to Kerfol, sent for his vassals and tenants, and told them he was to be married at All Saints to Anne de Barrigan of Dornenay, and on All Saints Day the marriage took place. As to the next few years, the evidence on both sides seems to show that they passed happily for the couple. No one was found to say that Yves de Cournot had been unkind to his wife, and it was plain to all that he was content with his bargain. Indeed, it was admitted by the chaplain and other witnesses for the prosecution that the young lady had a softening influence on her husband, and that he became less exacting with his tenants, less harsh to peasants and dependents, and less subject to the fits of gloomy silence which had darkened his widowhood. As to his wife, the only grievance her champions could call up in her behalf was that Kerfol was a lonely place, and that when her husband was away on business, at Rennes or Morlaix, whither she was never taken, she was not allowed so much as to walk in the park unaccompanied. But no one asserted that she was unhappy, though one servant woman said that she surprised her crying, and had heard her say that she was a woman accursed to have no child, and nothing in life to call her own. But that was a natural enough feeling in a wife attached to her husband, and certainly it must have been a great grief to Yves de Cournot that she gave him no son. Yet he never made her feel her childlessness as a reproach. She herself admits this in her evidence, but seemed to try to make her forget it by showering gifts and favours on her, Rich though he was, he had never been open-handed, but nothing was too fine for his wife, in the way of silks or gems or linen, or whatever else she fancied. Every wandering merchant was welcome at Kerfol, and when the master was called away he never came back without bringing his wife a handsome present, something curious and particular, from Morlaix or Rennes or Compé. One of the waiting women gave, in cross-examination, an interesting list of one year's gifts, which I copy. From Morlaix, a carved ivory junk, with Chinamen at the oars, that a strange sailor had brought back as a votive offering for Notre-Dame de la Clare, above Plomenac. From Compé, an embroidered gown, worked by the nuns of the Assumption. From Rennes, a silver rose that opened and showed an amber virgin with a crown of garnets. From Morlaix, again, a length of Damascus velvet shot with gold, bought of a Jew from Syria, and for Michaelmas that same year, from Rennes, a necklet or bracelet of round stone, emeralds and pearls and rubies, strung like beads on a gold wire. This was the present that pleased the lady best, the woman said. Later on, as it happened, it was produced at the trial, and it appears to have struck the judges and the public as a curious and valuable jewel. The very same winter the baron absented himself again, this time as far as Bordeaux, and on his return he brought his wife something even odder and prettier than the bracelet. It was a winter evening when he rode up to Kerfol, and walking into the hall found her sitting listlessly by the fire, her chin on her hand, looking into the fire. He carried a velvet box in his hand, and setting it down on the hearth, lifted the lid, and let out a little golden-brown dog. Anne de Colnaud exclaimed with pleasure as the little creature bounded towards her. "'No, it looks like a bird or butterfly,' she cried as she picked it up. 
and the dog put its paws on her shoulders and looked at her with eyes like a christian's after that she would never have it out of her sight and petted and talked to it as if it had been a child as indeed it was the dearest thing to a child she was to know yves de corneau was much pleased with his purchase the dog had been brought to him by a sailor from an east india merchantman and the sailor had bought it of a pilgrim in a bazaar at jaffa who had stolen it from a nobleman's wife in china a perfectly permissible thing to do since the pilgrim was a christian and the nobleman a heathen doomed to hell-fire yves de corneau had paid a long price for the dog for they were beginning to be in demand at the french court and the sailor knew that he had got hold of a good thing but anne's pleasure was so great that to see her laugh and play with the little animal her husband would have doubtless given twice the sum so far all the evidence is at one and the narrative plain sailing but now the steering becomes difficult i will try and keep as nearly as possible to anne's own statements though towards the end poor thing well to go back the very year after the little brown dog was brought to Calfol, yves de colneau one winter night was found dead at the head of a narrow flight of stairs leading down from his wife's rooms to a door opening on the court it was his wife who found him and gave the alarm so distracted poor wretch with fear and horror for his blood was all over her that at first the roused household could not make out what she was saying and thought she had gone suddenly mad but there sure enough at the top of the stairs lay her husband stone dead and head foremost the blood from his wounds dripping down to the steps below him he had been dreadfully scratched and gashed about the face and throat as if with a dull weapon and one of his legs had a deep tear in it which had cut an artery and probably caused his death but how did he come there and who had murdered him his wife declared that she had been asleep in her bed and hearing his cry had rushed out to find him lying on the stairs but this was immediately questioned in the first place it was proved that from her room she could not have heard the struggle on the stairs owing to the thickness of the walls and the length of the intervening passage then it was evident that she had not been in bed and asleep since she was dressed when she roused the house and her bed had not been slept in moreover the door at the bottom of the stairs was ajar and the key was in the lock and it was noticed by the chaplain an observant man that the dress she wore was stained with blood about the knees and that there were traces of small blood-stained hands low down on the staircase walls so that it was conjectured that she had really been to the postern door when her husband fell and feeling her way up to him in the darkness on her hands and knees had been stained by his blood dripping down on her of course it was argued on the other side that the blood marks on her dress might have been caused by her kneeling down by her husband when she rushed out of her room but there was the open door below and the fact that the finger marks in the staircase all pointed upward the accused held to her statement for the first two days in spite of its improbability but on the third day word was brought to her that herve de l'enrivain a young nobleman of the neighbourhood had been arrested for complicity in the crime two or three witnesses thereupon came forward to say that it was known throughout the country that l'enrivain had formerly been on good terms with the lady of corner but that he had been absent from brittany for over a year and people had ceased to associate their names the witnesses who made this statement were not of a very reputable sort one was an old herb-gatherer suspected of witchcraft another a drunken clerk from a neighbouring parish the third a half-witted shepherd who could be made to say anything and it was clear that the prosecution was not satisfied with its case and would have liked to find more definite proof of l'enrivain's complicity than the statement of the herb-gatherer who swore to having seen him climbing the walls of the park on the night of the murder one way of patching out incomplete proofs in those days was to put some sort of pressure moral or physical on the accused person it is not clear what sort of pressure was put on anne de corneau but on the third day when she was brought into court she appeared weak and wandering and after being encouraged to collect herself and speak the truth on her honour and the wounds of her blessed redeemer she confessed that she had in fact gone down the stairs to speak with herve de l'enrivain who denied everything and had been surprised there by the sound of her husband's fall that was better 
and the prosecution rubbed its hands with satisfaction. The satisfaction increased when the various dependents living at Kerfol were induced to say, with apparent sincerity, that during the year or two preceding his death, their master had once more grown uncertain and irascible, and subject to the fits of brooding silence which his household had learned to dread before his second marriage. This seemed to show that things had not been going well at Kerfol, although no one could be found to say that there had been any signs of open disagreement between husband and wife. And de Cournot, when questioned as to her reason for going down at night to open the door to Herbe de Lanrivain, made an answer which must have sent a smile round the court. She said it was because she was lonely and wanted to talk with the young man. Was this the only reason, she was asked, and replied, Yes, by the cross over your lordship's heads. But why at midnight? the court asked. Because I could see him in no other way. I can see the exchange of glances across the ermine collars under the crucifix. And de Cournot, further questioned, said that her married life had been extremely lonely. Desolate was the word she used. It was true that her husband seldom spoke harshly to her, but there were days when he did not speak at all. It was true that he had never struck or threatened her, but he kept her like a prisoner at Kerfol, and when he rode away to Morlaix or Compé or Rennes, he set so close a watch on her that she could not pick a flower in the garden without having a waiting-woman at her heels. "'I am no queen to need such honours," she once said to him, and he had answered that a man who has a treasure does not leave a key in the lock when he goes out. "'Then take me with you,' she urged, but to this he said the towns were pernicious places, and young wives better off at their own firesides. "'But what did you say to Herbe de Lanrivant? the court asked, and she answered, "'To ask him to take me away.' "'Ah, oh, you confess that you went down to him with adulterous thoughts?' "'No.' "'Then why did you want him to take you away?' "'Because I was afraid for my life.' "'Of whom were you afraid?' "'Of my husband.' "'Why were you afraid of your husband?' "'Because he had strangled my little dog.' Another smile must have passed around the court-room. In days when any nobleman had right to hang his peasants, and most of them exercised it, pinching a pet animal's windpipe was nothing to make a fuss about. At this point one of the judges, who appears to have had a certain sympathy for the accused, suggested that she should be allowed to explain herself in her own way, and she thereupon made the following statement. The first years of her marriage had been lonely, but her husband had not been unkind to her. If she had had a child, she would not have been unhappy, but the days were long, and it rained too much. It was true that her husband, whenever he went away and left her, brought her a handsome present on his return, but this did not make up for the loneliness. At least nothing had, till he brought her the little brown dog from the east. After that she was much less unhappy. Her husband seemed pleased that she was so fond of the dog. He gave her leave to put her jewelled bracelet around his neck, and to keep it always with her. One day she had fallen asleep in her room, with the dog at her feet, as his habit was. Her feet were bare and resting on his back. Suddenly she was waked by her husband. He stood beside her, smiling, not unkindly. You look like my great-grandmother Julien de Cournot, lying in the chapel with her feet on a little dog, he said. The analogy sent a chill through her, but she laughed and answered, Well, when I am dead, you must put me beside her, carved in marble, with my dog at my feet. Eh, we'll wait and see, he said, laughing also, but with his black brows close together. The dog is an emblem of fidelity. And do you doubt my right to lie with mine at my feet? When I'm in doubt, I find out, he answered. I am an old man, he added, and people say I make you lead a lonely life, but I swear you shall have your monument if you earn it. And I swear to be faithful, she returned, if only for the sake of having my little dog at my feet. Not long afterwards he went on business to the Compe Assizes, and while he was away his aunt, the widow of a great nobleman of the duchy came to spend a night at Kerfol on her way to the pardon of St. Barbe. She was a woman of great piety in consequence, and much respected by Yves de Cournot, 
and when she proposed to Anne to go with her to St. Barb, no one could object, and even the chaplain declared himself in favour of the pilgrimage. So Anne set out for St. Barb, and there for the first time she talked with Herbe de Lanrivain. He had come once or twice to Carefol with his father, but she had never before exchanged a dozen words with him. They did not talk for more than five minutes now. It was under the chestnuts as the procession was coming out of the chapel. He said, I pity you, and she was surprised, for she had not supposed that any one thought her an object of pity. He added, Call for me when you need me, and she smiled a little, but was glad afterwards and thought often of the meeting. She confessed to having seen him three times afterward, not more. How or where she would not say. One had the impression that she feared to implicate someone. Their meetings had been rare and brief, and at the last he had told her that he was starting the next day for a foreign country, on a mission which was not without peril, and might keep him for many months absent. He asked her for a remembrance, and she had none to give him but the collar about the little dog's neck. She was sorry afterwards that she had given it, but he was so unhappy at going that she had not had the courage to refuse. Her husband was away at the time. When he returned a few days later, he picked up the little dog to pet it, and noticed that his collar was missing. His wife told him that the dog had lost it in the undergrowth of the park, and that she and her maids had hunted a whole day for it. It was true, she explained to the court, that she had made the maids search for the necklet. They all believed the dog had lost it in the park. Her husband made no comment and that evening at supper he was in his usual mood, between good and bad. You could never tell which. He talked a great deal, describing what he had seen and done at Wren. But now and then he stopped and looked hard at her, and when she went to bed she found her little dog strangled on her pillow. The little thing was dead, but still warm. She stooped to lift it, and her distress turned to horror when she discovered that it had been strangled by twisting twice round his throat the necklet she had given to Lanrivain. The next morning at dawn she buried the dog in the garden, and hid the necklet in her breast. She said nothing to her husband, then or later, and he said nothing to her, but that day he had a present hanged for stealing a faggot in the park, and the next day he nearly beat to death a young horse he was breaking. Winter set in, and the short days passed, and the long nights, one by one, and she heard nothing of Herbe de Lanrivain. It might be that her husband had killed him, or merely that he had been robbed of the necklet. Day after day by the hearth, among the spinning maids, night after night alone on her bed, she wondered and trembled. Sometimes at table her husband looked across at her and smiled and then she felt sure that Lanrivain was dead. She dared not try to get news of him, for she was sure her husband would find out if she did. She had an idea that he could find out anything. Even when a witch-woman who was a noted seer and could show you the whole world in her crystal came to the castle for a night's shelter, and the maids flocked to her, Anne held back. The winter was long and black and rainy. One day, in Yves de Corneau's absence, some gypsies came to Careful with a troop of performing dogs. Anne bought the smallest and cleverest, a white dog with a feathery coat and one blue and one brown eye. It seemed to have been ill-treated by the gypsies, and clung to her plaintively when she took it from them. That evening her husband came back, and when she went to bed she found the dog strangled on her pillow. After that, she said to herself, that she would never have another dog. But one bitter cold evening a poor lean greyhound was found whining at the castle gate, and she took him in, and forbade the maids to speak of him to her husband. She hid him in a room that no one went to, smuggled food to him from her own plate, made him a warm bed to lie on, and petted him like a child. Yves de Cordonneau came home, and the next day she found the greyhound strangled on her pillow. She wept in secret, but said nothing, and resolved that even she met a dog die of hunger she would never bring him into the castle. But one day she found a young sheep-dog, a brindled puppy with good blue eyes, lying with a broken leg in the snow of the park. Yves de Corneau was at Rennes, and she brought the dog in, warmed and fed it, tied up its leg and hid it in the castle till her husband's return. The day before she gave it to a peasant woman who lived a long way off, 
and paid her handsomely to care for it and say nothing. But that night she heard a whining and scratching at her door, and when she opened it the lame puppy, drenched and shivering, jumped up on her with little sobbing barks. She hid him in her bed, and the next morning was about to have him taken back to the peasant woman when she heard her husband ride into the court. She shut the dog in a chest and went down to receive him. An hour or two later, when she returned to her room, the puppy lay strangled on her pillow. After that, she dared not make a pet of any other dog, and her loneliness became almost unendurable. Sometimes, when she crossed the court of the castle, and thought no one was looking, she stopped to pat the old pointer at the gate. But one day, as she was caressing him, her husband came out of the chapel, and the next day, the old dog was gone. This curious narrative was not told in one sitting of the court, or received without impatience and incredulous comment. It was plain that the judges were surprised by its puerility, and that it did not help the accused in the eyes of the public. It was an odd tale, certainly, but what did it prove? That Yves de Corneau disliked dogs, and that his wife, to gratify her own fancy, persistently ignored this dislike. As for pleading this trivial disagreement as an excuse for her relations, whatever their nature, with her supposed accomplice, the argument was so absurd that her own lawyer manifestly regretted having let her make use of it, and tried several times to cut short her story. But she went on to the end with a kind of hypnotised insistence, as though the scenes she evoked were so real to her that she had forgotten where she was and imagined herself to be reliving them. At length the judge, who had previously shown a certain kindness to her, said, leaning forward a little, one may suppose from his row of dozing colleagues, Then you would have us believe that you murdered your husband because he would not let you keep a pet dog? I did not murder my husband. Who then did? Herve de Longrivain? No. Who then? Can you tell us? Yes, I can tell you. The dogs. At that point she was carried out of the court in a swoon. It was evident that her lawyers had tried to get her to abandon this line of defence. Possibly her explanation, whatever it was, had seemed convincing enough when she poured it out to him in the heat of their first private colloquy. But now that it was exposed to the cold daylight of judicial scrutiny, and the banter of the town, he was thoroughly ashamed of it, and would have sacrificed her without a scruple to save his professional reputation. But the obstinate judge, who perhaps, after all, was more inquisitive than kindly, evidently wanted to hear the story out, and she was ordered the next day to continue her deposition. She said that, after the disappearance of the old watchdog, nothing particular happened for a month or two. Her husband was much as usual. She did not remember any special incident. But one evening a peddler woman came to the castle and was selling trinkets to the maids. She had no heart for trinkets, but she stood looking on while the women made their choice. And then, she did not know how, but the peddler coaxed her into buying for herself an odd pear-shaped pomander with a strong scent in it. She had once seen something of the kind on a gypsy woman. She had no desire for the pomander, and did not know why she had bought it. The peddler said that whoever wore it had the power to read the future, but she did not really believe that, or care much either. However, she bought the thing and took it up to her room, where she sat turning it about in her hand. Then the strange scent attracted her, and she began to wonder what kind of spice was in the box. She opened it and found a grey bean rolled in a strip of paper, and on the paper she saw a sign she knew, and a message from Herve de Longrivain, saying that he was home again and would be at the door in the court that night after the moon had set she burned the paper and then sat down to think it was nightfall and her husband was at home she had no way of warning lanrivan and there was nothing to do but to wait at this point i fancy the drowsy court-room beginning to wake up even to the oldest hand on the bench there must have been a certain aesthetic relish in picturing the feelings of a woman on receiving such a message at nightfall from a man living twenty miles away to whom she had no means of sending a warning she was not a clever woman i imagine and as a first result of her cogitation she appears to have made the mistake of being that evening 
too kind to her husband. She could not ply him with wine, according to the traditional expedient, for though he drank heavily at times, he had a strong head, and when he drank beyond its strength, it was because he chose to, and not because a woman coaxed him. Not his wife, at any rate. She was an old story by now. As I read the case, I fancied there was no feeling for her left in him but the hatred occasioned by his supposed dishonour. At any rate, she tried to call up her old graces, but early in the evening he complained of pains and fever, and left the hall to go up to his room. His servant carried him a cup of hot wine, and brought back word that he was sleeping, and not to be disturbed, and an hour later, when Anne lifted the tapestry and listened at his door, she heard his loud, regular breathing. She thought it might be a faint, and stayed a long time barefooted in the cold passage, her ear to the crack, but the breathing went on too steadily and naturally to be other than that of a man in a sound sleep. She crept back to her room, reassured, and stood in a window, watching the moon set through the trees of the park. The sky was misty and starless, and after the moon went down the night was pitch black. She knew the time had come, and stole along the passage, past her husband's door, where she stopped again to listen to his breathing, to the top of the stairs. There she paused a moment, and assured herself that no one was following her. Then she began to go down the stairs in the darkness. They were so steep and winding that she had to go very slowly, for fear of stumbling. Her one thought was to get the door unbolted, tell L'Enrivain to make his escape, and hasten back to her room. She had tried the bolt earlier in the evening, and managed to put a little grease on it. But nevertheless, when she drew it, it gave a squeak. Not loud, but it made her heart stop, and the next minute, overhead, she heard a noise. What noise? the prosecution interposed. My husband's voice calling out my name and cursing me. What did you hear after that? A terrible scream and a fall. Where was Herve de Lanrivain at this time? He was standing outside in the court. I made him out in the darkness. I told him, for God's sake, to go, and then I pushed the door shut. What did you do next? I stood at the foot of the stairs and listened. What did you hear? I heard dogs snarling and panting. Visible discouragement of the bench, boredom of the public, and exasperation of the lawyer for the defence. Dogs again! But the inquisitive judge insisted. What dogs? She bent her head and spoke so low that she had to be told to repeat her answer. I don't know. How do you mean you don't know? I don't know what dogs. The judge again intervened. Try to tell us exactly what happened. How long did you remain at the foot of the stairs? Only a few minutes. And what was going on meanwhile overhead? The dogs kept on snarling and panting. Once or twice he cried out. I think he moaned once. Then he was quiet. Then what happened? Then I heard a sound like the noise of a pack when the wolf is thrown to them, gulping and lapping. There was a groan of disgust and repulsion through the court, and another attempted intervention by the distracted lawyer. But the inquisitive judge was still inquisitive. And all the while you did not go up? Yes, I went up then, to drive them off. The dogs? Yes. Well? When I got there, it was quite dark. I found my husband's flint and steel and struck a spark. I saw him lying there. He was dead. And the dogs? The dogs were gone. Gone? Where to? I don't know. There was no way out, and there were no dogs at Kerfol. He strained herself to her full height, threw her arms above her head, and fell down on the stone floor with a long scream. There was a moment of confusion in the courtroom. Someone on the bench was heard to say, This is clearly a case for the ecclesiastical authorities. And the prisoner's lawyer, doubtless, jumped at the suggestion. After this, the trial loses itself in a maze of cross-questioning and squabbling. Every witness who was called corroborated Anne de Cournot's statement that there were no dogs at Careful. Had been none for several months. The master of the house had taken a dislike to dogs. There was no denying it. 
but on the other hand at the inquest there had been long and bitter discussion as to the nature of the dead man's wounds one of the surgeons called in had spoken of marks that looked like bites the suggestion of witchcraft was revived and the opposing lawyers hurled tomes of necromancy at each other at last anne de colneau was brought back into court at the instance of the same judge and asked if she knew where the dog she spoke of could have come from on the body of her redeemer she swore that she did not then the judge put his final question if the dogs you think you heard had been known to you do you think you would have recognized them by their barking yes did you recognize them yes what dogs do you take them to have been my dead dogs she said in a whisper she was taken out of court not to reappear there again there was some kind of ecclesiastical investigation and the end of the business was that the judges disagreed with each other and with the ecclesiastical committee and that anne de cornot was finally handed over to the keeping of her husband's family who shut her up in the keep of careful where she is said to have died many years later a harmless madwoman so ends her story as for that of elve de l'enrivain i had only to apply to his collateral descendant for its subsequent details the evidence against the young man being insufficient and his family influence in the duchy considerable he was set free and left soon afterwards for paris he was probably in no mood for a worldly life and he appears to have come almost immediately under the influence of the famous m arnold d'andely and the gentlemen of port royal a year or two later he was received into their order and without achieving any particular distinction he followed its good and evil fortunes till his death some twenty years later l'enrivain showed me a portrait of him by a pupil of philippe de champagne sad eyes an impulsive mouth and a narrow brow poor air de l'enrivain it was a grey ending yet as i looked at his stiff and sallow effigy in the dark dress of the jansenists i found myself almost envying his fate after all in the course of his life two great things had happened to him he had loved dramatically and he must have talked with pascal end of section four section five of p d goth in the dark by ronald kayser it was a tale of sheer horror that old asa gregg poured on to the dictaphone the watchman's flashlight printed a white circle on the frosted glass black lettered door greg chemical co mfrs asa greg president private the watchman's hand closed on the knob rattled the door in its frame queer but thought the sound had seemed to come from in there but that couldn't be he knew that mr greg and miss caruthers carried the only keys to the office so any intruder would have been forced to smash the lock maybe the sound came from the storage room the watchman clumped along the rubber matted corridor flung his weight against that door it opened hard being of ponderous metal fitted into a cork casing the room was an air-tight fireproof vault really his shoes gritted on the concrete floor as he prowled among the big porcelain vats. The flashlight bored through bluish haze to the concrete walls. Acid fumes escaping under the vat lids made the haze and seared the man's throat. He hurried out, coughing and wiping his eyes. It was damn funny. Every night lately he heard the same peculiar noise somewhere in this wing of the building. Like a body groaning and turning in restless sleep, it was. It scared him. He didn't mention the mystery to anyone, though. He was an old man, and he didn't want Mr. Gregg to think he was getting too old for the job. I should think I was crazy if I told him about it, he mumbled. Inside the office, Ozzie Gregg heard the muttered words plainly. He sat very still in the big leather cushioned chair, hardly breathing until the scrape of the watchman's feet had thinned away down the hall. There was no light in the room to betray him, only the cherry-colored tip of his cigar which couldn't be visible through the frosted glass door. Anyway, it would be an hour before the watchman's round brought him past the office again. Oz and Greg had that hour, if he could screw up his nerve to use it. He took the frayed end of the cigar from his mouth. His hand, which had wasted to mere skin and bone these past few months, groped through the darkness, slid over the polished coolness of the dictaphone hood, and snapped the switch. 
Machinery faintly whirred. His fingers found the tube, lifted it. Miss Caruthers, he snapped. He then hesitated. Surely he could trust Mary Caruthers. He'd never wondered about her before. He'd been the secretary for a dozen years lately, since he couldn't look after affairs himself as he used to. She had practically run the business. She was forty, sensible, unbeautiful, and tight-lipped. Hell, he had to trust her. His voice plunged into the darkness. What I have to say now is intended for Mrs. Gregg's ears only. She will take the first boat home, of course. Meet that boat and bring her to the office, since my wife knows nothing about a dictaphone. It will be necessary for you to set this record running, as soon as you have done so, to leave her alone in the room. Make sure she's not interrupted for a half hour, that's all. He waited a decent interval. The invisible needle peeled its thread into the revolving wax cylinder. Jeanette murdered as, as a Greg and hesitated again. This wasn't going to be easy to say. He decided to begin matter-of-factly. As you probably know, my will and the insurance policies are in the vault at the First National. I believe you will find all my papers in excellent order. If any questions arise, consult Miss Caruthers. What I have to say to you now is purely personal. I feel, my dear, that I owe you an explanation, that is. God, it came harder than he had expected. Jeanette, he started in afresh. You remember three years ago when I was in the hospital. You were in Palm Beach at the time. I wired that there'd been an accident here at the plant. That wasn't strictly so. The fact is, I got mixed up with the girl. He paused, shivering in the darkness. A picture of Dot swam before him. The oval face, framed by gleaming swirls of lemon-tinted hair, had pouting scarlet lips and eyes whose allure was intensified by violet makeup. The full-length picture of her included a streamlined, full-blossomed, and yet delectably lithe body, a costly, enticing Broadway chorus orchid. As a matter of fact, that was where he'd found her. I won't make any excuses for myself, Asa Greg said harshly. I might point out that you were always in Florida, or Bermuda, or France, and that I was a lonely man. But it wasn't just loneliness, and I didn't seek companionship. I thought I was making the last bow to romance. I was successful, sixty, and silly, and I did all the damn fool things. I even wrote letters to her, popsy-wopsy letters. The dictaphone couldn't record the grimace that jerked his lips. She saved them, of course, and by and by, she put in price on them, ten thousand dollars dot claimed that that one of those filthy tabloids had offered her that much for them and what was a poor working girl to do she lied i knew that i told her to bring the letters to the office after business hours and i'd take care of her i took care of her all right i shot her jeanette he mopped his face with a handkerchief that was already damp not on account of the money you understand it was the things she said after she had tucked the bills into her purse, the vile things about the way she had earned it ten times over by enduring my beastly kisses. I'd really loved that girl, and I thought she'd care for me a little. It was her hate that maddened me, and I got the gun out of my desk drawer. Ozzegreg reached through the darkness for the switch. He fumbled for the bottle which stood on the desk. His hand trembled, spilling some of the liquor onto his lap. He drank from the bottle. This part of the story he'd skip. It was too horrible, even to think about it. He didn't want to remember how the blood pooled inside Dot's fur coat, and how he'd managed to carry the body out of the office without leaking any of her blood onto the floor. He tried to forget the musky sweetness of the perfume on the dead girl, mingled with that other evil blood smell. Especially, he didn't want to remember the frightful time he'd had stripping the gold rings from her fingers, and the one gold tooth in her head. The horror of it coiled in the blackness about him. His own teeth rattled against the bottle when he gulped the second drink. He snapped the switch savagely, but when he spoke his voice cringed into the tube. I carried her into the storage room. I got the lid off one of the acid tanks. The vat contained an acid powerful enough to destroy anything except gold. In fact, the vat itself had to be lined with gold leaf. I knew that in twenty-four hours there wouldn't be a recognizable body left, and in a week there wouldn't be anything at all. No matter what the police suspected, they couldn't prove a murder charge without a corpus delecti. I had committed the perfect crime, even for one thing. I didn't realize that there'd be a splash when she went into the vat. Greg laughed, not pleasantly. 
his wife might think it been a sob when she heard this record. Now you understand why I went to the hospital, he jerked. Possibly you call that poetic justice. Oh, God. His voice broke. Again he thumbed off the switch and mopped his face with the damp linen. The rest, how could he explain the rest of it? He spent a long minute arranging his thoughts. You haven't any idea, he resumed. No one has any idea of how I'd been punished for the thing I did. I don't mean the sheer physical agony, but the fear I'd talk coming out of the ether at the hospital. The fear that she'd been traced to my office. I'd simply hidden her rings away expecting to drop them into the river, or that she might have confided in her lover. Yes, she had one, or suppose a whopping big order came through, and that tank was emptied the very next day. And I couldn't ask any questions. I didn't even know what was in the papers. However, that part of it gradually cleared up. I quizzed Mrs. Caruthers and learned that an unidentified female body had been fished out of the East River a few days after Dot disappeared. That's how the police solved the case. I got rid of her rings. I ordered that the vat left alone. The other thing began about six months ago. A spasm comforted his face. His fingers ached their grip into the dictaphone tube. Jeanette, you remember when I began to object to the radio, how I'd shout at you, to turn it off in the middle of a program? You thought I was ill and worried about business? You were wrong. The thing that got me was hearing her voice. He gripped the gold cigar, chewed it. It's very strange that you didn't notice it. No matter what station we dialed to, always that same voice came stealing into the room. But perhaps you did notice? You said once or twice that all those blues singers sounded alike. And she was a blue singer. It was she, all right. Somewhere out in the ether, reminding me. The next thing was, well, at first, when I noticed in the office, I thought Miss Caruthers had suddenly taken up with young ideas. You see, I kept smelling perfume, and he smelled it now. It was like a miasma in the dark. It isn't anything that Caruthers wears, he grated. It comes from, yes, a storage room. I realized that about a month ago. Just after you sailed one night. I stayed late at the office, and I went in there. It seemed to be strongest around the vat. Her vat, and I lifted the lid. The sweet, sticky musk smell hit me like a blow in the face. And that isn't all. Terror stalked in this room. Ozza Gregg crouched in his chair, felt the weight of fear on him like a submarine pressure. His cigar pitched to his knees, dropped to the floor. You won't believe this, Jeanette. He hammered the works like nails into the darkness in front of him. You will say that it's impossible. I know that. It is impossible. It is a psychological absurdity. It contradicts the laws of natural science. But I saw something on the bottom of that vat. He groped for the bottle. His wife would hear a long gurgle and then a coughing gasp. The vat was nearly full of his transparent, oily acid, he went on. What I saw was a lot of sediment on the golden floor, and there shouldn't have been any sediment. The stuff utterly dissolves animal tissue, bone, even the common ores, keeps them in suspicion. It didn't look like sediment either. It looked like a heap of mold, grave mold. I replaced the lid. I spent a week convincing myself that it was all impossible, that I couldn't have seen anything of the sort. Then I went to the vat again. Silence hung in the darkness while he sucked wind into his lungs, and the words burst, separate yammering shrieks. I looked night after night for hours at a time I've watched the change. Did you ever see a body decompose? Of course not. Neither have I. But you must know in a general way what the process is. Well, this has been the exact opposite. First I stared at the heap of grave mold as it shaped itself into bones, a skeleton. I watched the coming of hair, a yellow tangle of it sprouting from the bare round skull until, oh God, the flesh began making himself before my eyes. I couldn't bear any more. I stayed away, didn't come to the office for five days. The tube slipped from his sweating, slick fingers. Panting, Ozza Greg fumbled in the dark until he found it. Exhaustion, not self-control, flattened his voice into a deadly monotone. I tried to think of a way out if I could fish the corpse out of the tank. But I couldn't smuggle it out of the plant alone. You know that, and so do I. Besides, what would be the use? If acid can't kill her, nothing can. That's why I can't have the lid cemented on. It wouldn't do any good either, until three days ago. She hadn't the least color, looked as white as a ghost in the vat. A naked ghost because there's been no resurrection for her clothing.
I watched her limbs grow rosy. Her lips are scarlet. Her eyes are bright. They opened yesterday, and her breasts were rising and falling. Oh, almost imperceptibly. But that was last night. And tonight, I swear it, her lips moved. She muttered my name. She turned. She'd been lying on her side over onto her back. The record would be badly blurred. His hand shook violently, bobbled the tube against his lips. Greg braced his elbow against the desk. She isn't dead, he choked. She's only asleep. Not very soundly asleep. She's waking up. The invisible needle quivered as it traced several noises. There was his tortured breathing and the clawing of his fingernails rattling over the desk. The drawer clicked as it opened. The loud click was the cooking of the revolver. Soon she's going to get out of that vat, Greg bleated. Jeanette, forgive me. God forgive me, but I will not. I cannot. I dare not stay here to see her then. The sound of the shot brought the watchman stumbling along the corridor. He crashed against the office door. It banged open in a shower of falling frosted glass. The watchman's flashlight severed the darkness and printed its white circle on the face of Ozza Gregg. He had fallen back into the chair, a blackish gout of blood, running from the hole in his temple. He started sightlessly into the light with his eyes that were two gnarls of shrunken brown flesh, like knots in a pine board. Ozzy Gregg was blind, had been, since that night, three years past when the acid splashed. End of story. Section 6 of P.D. Goth The Last Revel in Prince Hall by Charles M. Skinner Young man, I'll give thee five dollars a week to be caretaker in Prince Hall, said Quaker Quid to Fiddler Matthews on an autumn evening. Young Matthews had just been taunting the old gentleman with being afraid to sleep on his own domain, and as the eyes of all the tavern loungers were on him he could hardly decline so flattering a proposition. So, after some hemming and hawing, he said he would take the Quaker at his word. He played but two or three more tunes that evening, did Peter Matthews, and played them rather sadly. Then, as Quid had finished his mulled cider and departed, he took his homeward way in thoughtful mood. Prince Hall stood in a lonely, weed-grown garden near Chester, Pennsylvania, and thither repaired Peter, as next day's twilight shut down, with a mattress, blanket, comestibles, his beloved fiddle, and a flask of whiskey. Ensconcing himself in the room that was least depressing in appearance, he stuffed rag into the vacant panes, lighted a candle, started a blaze in the fireplace, and ate his supper. "'Not so bad a place, after all,' mumbled Peter, as he warmed himself at the fire and the flask. Then, taking out his violin, he began to play. The echo of his music emphasized the emptiness of the house. The damp got into the strings so that they sounded tubby, and there were unintentional quavers in the melody whenever the trees swung against the windows and splashed them with rain, or when a distant shutter fell a-creaking. Finally he stirred the fire, bolted the door, snuffed his candle, took a courageous pull at the liquor, flung off his coat and shoes, rolled his blanket around him, stretched himself on the mattress, and fell asleep. He was awakened by well, he could not say what exactly, only he became suddenly as wide awake as ever he had been in his life, and listened for some sound that he knew was going to come out of the roar of the wind, and the slamming, grating, and whistling about the house. Yes, there it was, a tread and a clank on the stair. The door, so tightly bolted, flew open, and there entered a dark figure with steeple-crowned hat cloak, jack-boots, sword, and corslet. The terrified fiddler wanted to howl, but his voice was gone. "'I am Peter Prince, Governor-General of His Swedish Majesty's American Colonies and Builder of this house,' said the figure. "'Tis the night of the autumnal equinox, when my friends meet here for revel. Take thy fiddle and come. Play, but speak not.' and whether he wished or no, Peter was drawn to follow the figure, which he could make out by the phosphor gleam of it. Downstairs they went, doors swinging open before them, 
and along corridors that clanked to the stroke of the spectre's boot heels. Now they came to the ancient reception room, and as they entered it, Peter was dazzled. The floor was smooth with wax, logs snapping in the fireplace, though the flame was somewhat blue. The old hangings and portraits looked fresh, and in the light of wax candles a hundred people, in the brave array of old times, walked, courtesied, and seemed to laugh and talk together. As the fiddler appeared, every eye was turned on him in a disquieting way, and when he addressed himself to his bottle, from every throat came a hollow laugh. Finding his way to a chair, he sank into it, and put his instrument in position. At the first note the couples took hands, and as he struck into a jig they began to circle swiftly, leaping wondrous high. Faster went the music, for the whiskey was at work in Peter's noddle, and wilder grew the dance. It was as if the storm had come in through the windows and was blowing these people hither and yon, around and around. The fiddler vaguely wondered at himself, for he had never played so well, though he had never heard the tune before. Now loomed Governor Prince in the middle of the room, and extending his hand he ordered the dance to cease. "'Thou hast played well, fiddler,' he said, "'and shalt be paid.' Then, at his signal, came two negro men, tugging at a strong-box that Prince unlocked. It was filled with gold pieces. "'Hold thy fiddle-bag,' commanded the governor, and Peter did so, watching open-mouthed the transfer of a double handful of treasure from box to sack. Another such handful followed, and another. At the fourth Peter could no longer contain himself, he forgot the injunction not to speak, and shouted gleefully, "'Lord Harry, here's luck!' There was a shriek of demon laughter. The scene was lost in darkness, and Peter fell insensible. In the morning, a tavern-haunting friend, anxious to know if Peter had met with any adventure, entered the house and went cautiously from room to room, calling on the watcher to show himself. There was no response. At last he stumbled on the whiskey bottle, empty, and knew that Peter must be near. Sure enough, there he lay in the great room, with dust and mould thick on everything, and his fiddle smashed into a thousand pieces. Peter, on being awakened, looked ruefully about him, then sprang up and eagerly demanded his money. "'What money?' asked his friend. The fiddler clutched at his green bag, opened it, shook it there was nothing. Nor was there any delay in Peter's exit from that mansion, and when, twenty-four hours after, the house went up in flames, he averred that the ghosts had set it afire, and that he knew where they had brought their coals from. End of Section 6 Section 7 of P. D. Goth Edward Randolph's Portrait by Charles M. Skinner. Nothing is left of Province House, the old home of the royal governors, in Boston, but the gilded Indian that served as its weathercock and aimed his arrow at the winds from the cupola. The house itself was swept away long ago in the so-called March of Improvement. In one of its rooms hung a picture so dark that when Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson went to live there, hardly anybody could say what it represented. There were hints that it was a portrait of the devil, painted at a witch-meeting near Salem, and that on the eve of disasters in the province a dreadful face had glared from the canvas. Shirley had seen it on the night of the fall of Ticonderoga, and servants had gone shuddering from the room, certain that they had caught the glance of a malignant eye. It was known to the governors, however, that the portrait— if not that of the arch-fiend, was that of one who in the popular mind was none the less a devil, Edward Randolph, the traitor, who had repealed the first provincial charter and deprived the colonists of their liberties. Under the curse of the people he grew pale and pinched and ugly, his face at last becoming so hateful that men were unwilling to look at it. Then it was that he sat for his portrait. Threescore or odd years afterward, Hutchinson sat in the hall, wondering vaguely if coming events would consign him to the obloquy that had fallen on his predecessor, 
for at his bidding a fleet had come into the harbour with three regiments of redcoats on board, dispatched from Halifax to overawe the city. The coming of the selectmen to protest against quartering these troops on the people, and the substitution of martial for civic law, interrupted his reverie, and a warm debate arose. At last the governor seized his pen impatiently and cried, the king is my master, and England is my home. Upheld by them, I defy the rabble. He was about to sign the order for bringing in the troops when a curtain that had hung before the picture was drawn aside. Hutchinson stared at the canvas in amazement, then muttered, It is Randolph's spirit. It wears the look of hell. The picture was seen to be that of a man in antique garb, with the despairing, hunted, yet evil expression in the face, and seemed to stare at Hutchinson. "'It is a warning,' said one of the company. Hutchinson recovered himself with an effort, and turned away. "'It is a trick!' he cried, and bending over the paper he fixed his name as if in desperate haste. Then he trembled, turned white, and wiped a sweat from his brow. The selectmen departed in silence, but in anger, and those who saw Hutchinson on the streets next day affirmed that the portrait had stepped out of its canvas and stood at his side through the night. Afterward, as he lay on his deathbed, he cried that the blood of the Boston Massacre was filling his throat, and as his soul passed from him his face, in its agony and rage, was the face of Edward Randolph. End of section 7. Section 8 of P. D. Goth. The Headless Skeleton of Swamp Town by Charles M. Skinner. The boggy portion of North Kingston, Rhode Island, known as Swamp Town, is of queer repute in its neighborhood, for Hell Hollow, Pork Hill, Indian Corner, and Kettle Hole have their stories of Indian crimes and witch-meetings. Here the headless figure of a negro boy was seen by a belated traveller on a path that leads over the hills. It was a dark night, and the figure was revealed in a blaze of blue light. It swayed to and fro for a while, then rose from the ground with a lurch and shot into space, leaving a trail of illumination behind it. Here, too, is Goose Nest Spring, where the witches dance at night. It dries up every winter and flows through the summer, gushing forth on the same day of every year, except once, when a goose took possession of the empty bed and hatched her brood there. That time the water did not flow until she got away with her progeny. But the most gruesome story of the place is that of the Indian whose skull was found by a road-mender. The unsuspecting person took it home, and, as the women would not allow him to carry it into the house, he hung it on a pole outside. Just as the people were starting for bed, there came a rattling at the door, and, looking out of the windows, they saw a skeleton stalking around in quick and angry strides, like those of a person looking for something. But how could that be when the skeleton had neither eyes nor a place to carry them? It thrashed its bony arms impatiently, and its ribs rattled like a xylophone. The spectators were transfixed with fear, all except the culprit, who said through the window, in a matter-of-fact way, "'I left your head on the pole at the back door.' The skeleton started in that direction, seized the skull, clapped it into the place where a head should have grown on its own shoulders, and after shaking its fist in a threatening way at the house, disappeared in the darkness." It is said that he acts as a kind of guard in the neighborhood, to see that none of the other Indians buried there shall be disturbed, as he was. His principal lounging place is Indian Corner, where there is a rock from which blood flows when the moon shines, a memento, doubtless, of some tragedy that occurred there in times before the white men knew the place. There is iron in the soil, and visitors say that the red color is due to that and that the spring would flow just as freely on dark nights as on bright ones, if any were there to see it. But the natives, who have given some thought to these matters, know better. End of Section 8 Section 9 of P. D. Goth Werewolves of Detroit 
by Charles M. Skinner. Long were the shores of Detroit vexed by the snake god of Belle Isle and his children, the witches, for the latter sold enchantments and were the terror of good people. Jacques Morand, the coureur du bois, was in love with Jean-Vierre Parent, but she disliked him and wished only to serve the church. Courting having proved of no avail, he resolved on force when she had decided to enter a convent, and he went to one of the witches, who served as devil's agent, to sell his soul. The witch accepted the slight commodity and paid for it with a grant of power to change from a man's form to that of a werewolf, or loup garou, that he might the easier bear away his victim. Incautiously he followed her to Grosse Point, where an image of the Virgin had been set up, and as jean Vievre dropped at the feet of the statue to implore aid, the wolf, as he leaped to her side, was suddenly turned to stone. Harder was the fate of another maiden, Archange Simonet, for she was seized by a werewolf at this place and hurried away while dancing at her own wedding. The bridegroom devoted his life to the search for her, and finally lost his reason, but he prosecuted the hunt so vengefully and shrewdly that he always found assistance. One of the neighbors cut off the wolf's tail with a silver bullet, the appendage being for many years preserved by the Indians. The lover finally came upon the creature and chased it to the shore, where its footprint is still seen in one of the boulders, but it leaped into the water and disappeared. In his crazy fancy the lover declared that it had jumped down the throat of a catfish, and that is why the French Canadians have a prejudice against catfish as an article of diet. The man-wolf dared as much for gain as for love. On the night that Jean Chicot got the Indians drunk and bore off their beaver skins, the wood witches, known as the white women, fell upon him and tore a part of his treasure from him, while a werewolf pounced so hard on his back that he lost more. He drove the creatures to a little distance, but was glad to be safe inside of the fort again, though the officers laughed at him and called him a coward. When they went back over the route with him, they were astonished to find the grass scorched where the women had fled before him, and little springs in the turf showed where they had been swallowed up. Sulphur water was bubbling from the spot where the wolf dived into the earth, when the trader's rosary fell out of his jacket. Belle Fontaine, the spot was called, long afterward. End of section 9 That is the end of P.D. Goth.